Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Um, I know a number of you have mentioned to me that it's Veterans Day. You weren't sure we were open this morning or not, so I'm glad that you all remembered that we were and came for this morning's program. My name is Jessica Smith. I plan the adult programming here at the Farmington Main Library. And today is our seventh annual Crystal Knock Lecture. And I'm going to turn it over to our speaker, because he can certainly speak more about this. We have Dr. Leon Kamaitis here with us today. If you could please help me in welcoming him. Thank you very much for this very nice welcome and for turning out here. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? My voice is a little bit um, hoarse today, so I apologize for that. Many of you have probably already noticed that um, there's an error in this first slide and that the date should be November. The date should be November rather than October, of course. And that proves two things. Number one is that it's human to err. And number two, no matter how many times you go over to try to find mistakes, there's always one mistake that, mistake that escapes you. So now we found it, we can go on our way. As you all know, this year is the 75th anniversary of the night of terror, which was called Kristallnacht. And Kristallnacht, or the night of broken glass, refers to the night of November 9th to 10th, uh, when the Nazis unleashed an organized state-sanctioned, and that's a terribly important thing, organized and state-sanctioned, campaign of terror against the Jewish communities of Germany, Austria, and the recently acquired German, by the Germans, the territory of the Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia. The Germans claimed that this was a popular, spontaneous uprising, but we know from all research now that it was not, that it was state uh, organized and planned and executed uh, by them. And in its aftermath, the German jewelry was fined a thousand million marks for the damage. And to make sure that it was paid, there was a compulsory confiscation of 20% of every German Jew's property to pay for the damage of that night. During that night, <clears throat> Jewish-owned homes, stores, community centers were looted and destroyed. Uh, synagogues were vandalized and set on fire, and businesses were looted and destroyed. Now, you've probably seen these figures. Uh, there were approximately 15,000 Jews were arrested, 91 were killed, and 20 Jews committed suicide. Now these figures, it's important to note, are the official figures which were given. In fact, academics to this day are writing papers to give the exact toll of what took place on that night. For instance, of the people who were arrested, 1,000 of the arrested Jews were subsequently murdered in concentration camps, and they obviously were not counted among the 91 officially murdered people. A recent count of the desecrated and destroyed synagogues put the number at 1,500. So when you see these figures, you have to be, you have to question them. But we are looking back on this event from our vantage point. And our vantage point is very different. Our vantage point is a vantage point of the fact that we now know that in the next six years after 1938, six million Jews would be murdered. And just about all places of worship would be destroyed. And all, just about all Jewish businesses would be destroyed. 
So from our vantage point, looking back and looking whether at these numbers or at the real numbers several times that, we have to say that this does not look like an overwhelming event, no matter what the true number is. But the importance of Kristall Nacht is not in its magnitude. The importance of Kristall Nacht is in its symbolism. And there are two new things that have happened here. It's a turning point and it's a test. And that's the importance of Kristallnacht. Now, I was born just three years before this, in 1935. And I was born in Poland, just across the German-Polish border. And therefore, I have no personal memory of Kristallnacht. But <clears throat> my maternal grandfather, uh, Isaac Koenigsefer, was arrested that night. He was in Germany. He was German. He was arrested that night and sent to Buchenwald concentration camp. His family had lived in Germany for generations, and they, like most Jews, considered themselves to be thoroughly integrated into German society and German life. His father, <coughs> my maternal great-grandfather, Moses Jonas, received his PhD from Jena University in addition to his rabbinical ordination, and was the head of the Orthodox Jewish community of Fürth, as well as the director of the Jewish orphanage. And here's a photograph we took just several years ago. Now, his synagogue was inside this orphanage. And it was spared. It was the only synagogue in Fürth that was spared. The reason being that the fire department was consulted by the authorities, and it was the opinion of the fire department that if this synagogue was set on fire, it would set the neighboring non-Jewish homes and businesses on fire, and therefore it was not set on fire. That's the degree to which the authorities went in deciding which should be destroyed and which should not. Two of my grandfather's brothers Meyer and Josef, had served in the G German army. In his recollections written when he was in the 90s, my grandfather's brother Meyer tells about his experiences of serving in the Kaiser's army in the late 19th century and the tremendous lengths which the Kaiser's army went to to ensure that he had po proper kosher food and that he was off on all Jewish holidays. And I'm trying to show you the change which had occurred uh, in, that, uh, in that time. My grandfather's other brother, Yosef, fought in the First World War. And he was killed fighting for Germany on the Romanian front. His name appears on a commemorative plaque of Jewish soldiers from the community of Furt who fell fighting for Germany during that war. He was posthumously awarded a very high honor of a Ludwig Cross. And the mayor of Furt wrote a letter of condolence to his mother in which he stated May I offer you this consolation of gratitude that he who dies prematurely in battle for a great cause dies a heroic death, and his name shall shine forever in the honor roll of his fatherland and the city of Fürth. Now, when the Gestapo came to arrest him, my grandfather, who, as I told you, was sent to Buchenwald, naively showed the medal and the letter to the arresting hoodlums, uh, who then immediately threw them out the window, and that was that. My grandfather, like many who were arrested that night, was released after paying a bribe. But others were not as fortunate. As I mentioned, a thousand were murdered. And my maternal grandmother's brother, 
was returned to his family in a coffin with instructions not to open it on penalty of death. I'm sure he was not counted among the 91 who was officially killed. Kristallnacht has been called the beginning of the Shoah, or as it's common, it is commonly called, the Holocaust. But Kristallnacht was, in fact, not the first anti-Jewish act in Germany. But it did mark, as I mentioned, a turning point. Hitler became chancellor on January the 30th, 1933. The first anti-Jewish campaign occurred on, May, on March the 9th, when all Jewish lawyers and judges were dismissed in the town of Breslau. On April the 1st, stormtroopers enforced a boycott of Jewish businesses. By April the 7th, all Jewish civil servants were dismissed. On May 10, the Nazis organized a bonfire in front of Berlin University and burned thousands of so-called Jewish books. The Nuremberg Laws of September the 15th, 1935, deprived Jews of all civil liberties and any means of earning a livelihood. So far, all the actions were meant to demoralize and isolate, but they were not yet physical assaults. In 1933, my father, who as I said, we lived just across the border in Poland, was the rabbi of the community, wrote an essay in which he said, our souls are weighed down by an oppressive, paralyzing feeling that the source of all blessings has dried up for us, that the gates of hope have been barricaded, that the most difficult of all eras of our tragic, heroic history is about to dawn on us. And that was in 1933. By 1935, three years before Kristallnacht, he predicted that physical assault would follow when he wrote that the anti-Semites, quote, want to defame and degrade us. First, they proclaim a sentence of death for our spirit in order then with a clear conscience to bury our physical presence. Kristallnacht was the beginning of a physical assault against the Jews. It was also a test. What would be the reaction of Jewish citizens? Would they protest? Thousands participated. Hundreds of thousands were silent onlookers and but did not protest. How would the church react? One pastor, J. von Jan, gave a sermon against it. He was attacked by a mob and beaten. His vicar vicarage was destroyed, and he was imprisoned. There was no further protest from the church. How far would a world opinion allow Hitler to go? The world knew about these events. They were not hidden from view. England and France were timid. Americans were dealing with their own problems. The American economy had still not recovered from the Depression, and the weather catastrophes were blowing up a tragedy of a great dust bowl in the Midwest. Americans were still recovering from losses in the previous war, and in any case, they had had it with those crazy Europeans. The mood was one of minding our own business, isolationism. Hitler got the message he could proceed without opposition. As I mentioned, I was born just across the border in the town of Katowice, which had, as a matter of fact, until 1918, was German. And my mother tongue was German because my mother spoke German. She came from Germany. Our family consisted of my parents, My brother, Herbert. Agnes was our nanny. <clears throat> Here I am with her. And I have to tell you the story about this picture. 
because in the late 1980s, my wife and I went back to Katowice to, in order to set up a monument on the site where our synagogue used to stand. And this was got great press in the Polish um, newspapers, <laughs> and therefore my name was mentioned. And as I was standing in line to pay my bill in the hotel, I noticed a lady completely dressed in black standing. And she came up to me timidly and in Polish addre addressed me in Polish, Pan Chamaidis, and I said yes in Polish. And she said to me, happy birthday. And it had, in fact, been my birthday a few days before. And then she said, your brother's birthday is on September the 16th. And I looked at her and I said, you have to be Agnes. <laughs> and it was. And she gave me this picture after 51 years. <clears throat> we lived in an apartment house, which you see here on your left with the dome, which was built by my great-grandfather. It's considered a, an architectural wonder today, and you can find it on the web as in part of the architecture of the city of Katowice. Anna was our cook. I don't have a picture of her. And members of the family lived upstairs and around the corner. My brother is sitting on the floor as a shoemaker. This is on the on Purim, and I am dressed as a Mexican. <laughs> uh, six years later, only my brother and I would remain alive. Hitler attacked Poland on September the 1st, 1939. And just days before the beginning of the war, when I was about four, my parents decided that we should leave the border area. As you can see here, Katowice is right on the border. The black line demarcates the border between Germany and Poland and the southwestern corner of Poland. And the only direction open to us was eastward. And so we were intending to go to the city of Lvov, which is also known as Lviv today. It was known as Lemberg by the Germans. <clears throat> and the reason we were heading for Lviv was that my father was born in a small town close to Lviv, and my aunts and uncles and paternal grandparents still lived there. Now on August the 23rd, 1939, Germany and the Soviet Union signed a non-aggression pact. But unbeknownst to us or the rest of the world, there was an appendix to that pact. And that secret appendix divided Poland in two, the West being given to the Germans and the East being taken by the Russians. And in fact, this eventually became more or less the border between today's Ukraine and Poland. And so as you can see, when we fled to Lvov, we also fled unbeknownst to us at that time, into the Russian zones. And for the next two years, we were under Russian occupation. On June 21st, 1941, the Germans attacked <coughs> the Soviet Union in a campaign called Barbarossa. And they attacked on June 21st, 1941, and entered our region on July 1st, 1941. 
Prior to their retreat, the Soviet secret police, then called the NKVD, tortured and killed thousands of Ukrainian political prisoners. When their bodies was discovered, the Ukrainian population vented their rage on the Jews. And that is when I experienced my first pogrom. Jews were hauled from their homes, beaten, forced to wash cobblestones of the town square with toothbrushes. And I remember coming home in the evening with my mother and seeing my grandmother bruised and bleeding, but proud that the mob was not able to drag her out of her home. <clears throat> By July 10th, when the pogrom stopped, 10,000 Jews had been murdered in the vicinity of Lvov. Now, you have undoubtedly heard about the Warsaw Ghetto. You have undoubtedly heard about the Lord's Ghetto. But I bet that very few of you have heard about the Lvov Ghetto. And the reason for that is that despite the high mortality in Warsaw and Lord's, there were, thank, Lord, thank the Lord, many survivors, and therefore many witnesses who told their stories and who wrote about it, and that's the reason you've heard about it. Lvov was different. In contrast, in Lvov, Hitler almost succeeded. This is a plaque which appears on a railroad station in Lvov, the railroad station from which Jews were taken to Belgium. And it states here that from March 1942 until the beginning of 43, 500,000 Jews went through this station on their way to Belgium and extermination. In October 1941, there were between 119 and 150,000 Jews in the city. By November 1942, there were 29,000. By April 1943, there were 8,000. And when the Soviets entered in 1944, there were 823. <clears throat> the single worst action, as the German called their killing sprees, occurred in August of 1942 when between 50 and 60,000 Jews were murdered. It was then that my parents must have come to the conclusion that no Jews would survive. And so with great courage, my father turned to the Archbishop Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky, the head of the Ukrainian Catholic or Uniate Church, to help. The Uniate Church was established as a result of the Treaty of Brest in 1596. One byproduct of the Counter-Reformation was an attempt to unify the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic churches. And of course, that attempt has been going on ever since. Under this treaty in 1596, there were a certain number of adherents of what became known as the Uniate Church or the Greek Catholic Church, recognized the Pope as the head, the Pope of Rome as the head of their church and in turn were allowed to maintain their own Eastern traditions. So the Uniate Church was sort of a, and is today, a sort of a mixture. <coughs> they are Catholics, they recognize the Pope in Rome, but their practices are Eastern practices. They dress like Eastern priests. The uh, priests are allowed to marry, although the archbishops aren't and so on. So there are traditions of the East 
together with the political affiliation of the West. And this occurred primarily among people who lived in that part of Poland in which there were a lot of Ukrainians where they had constant communion with Roman Catholics. So it was primarily in Western Ukraine or Eastern Poland that the Uniate Church took hold. And Metropolitan Szczytyski was by now already a man in his late 70s. And he originally was Polish, but decided to become a Uniate leader, was appointed the Archbishop of Lviv, always had very good relationships with Jews. And my father approached him in August of 1942, and he agreed to take us in. So my brother and I were taken in by the, um, by the Studite order of the Uniate Church. Eventually, it is said that the Uniate Church hid approximately 150 Jews. <clears throat> and my wife and I attended a luncheon in New York a week ago at which the ADL presented the Jan Karski Medal, also called the Courage to Care, to the memory of Metropolitan Szeptycki in recognition for his role in saving Jewish lives. We've also been successful in getting a uh, bill passed through the Canadian Parliament uh, honoring him. Uh, and in June, uh, we were in Kiev uh, where they honored him also. At the beginning of the fall, probably in September or October of 1942, I don't remember the month, my father brought me to the Archbishop's Palace, the St. George's Cathedral uh, in Lviv. Now, I had just turned seven. And I'm sure that most of you can't remember what you were like when you were seven years old. But perhaps you have a grandchild or a niece or a nephew who's seven. And so you can imagine what a seven-year-old is like. So as a seven-year-old, I was brought to this church and was left there. I was given a new name. <clears throat> My name henceforth would be Levko Chaminsky. And I had to practice it and practice it until it rolled off my tongue. I had a new language. I had to learn Ukrainian, which I didn't know at all. And I had to learn the prayers in church Slavonic, which is a language written in Greek letters. It's an ancient Slavonic language. I had to forget my past never to speak of it to anyone, never to bathe or go to the bathroom while others were around. And whenever there was a German raid, I was quickly moved, sometimes in the middle of the night. Imagine also what this meant to the priests. There were many in on the conspiracy of hiding me. They did so on the penalty of death, hiding a Jew was automatic execution. And yet, despite the many people who were involved in hiding 150 Jews, there is not a record of a single Jew being betrayed by the Uniate priests. Now compare that to the silence of the rest of the church. I was first placed in an orphanage, and then very shortly after that, probably at the beginning of 43 or the end of 42, I was transferred to a monastery in a small village called Uni, where I spent the next two years. This monastery 
a very beautiful monastery which my wife and I visited in 07 <clears throat> when I took this picture. It was established in the 14th century and also had a children's home. It's in the foothills of the Capetian Mountains and is the major monastery today of the uh, <coughs> Greek Catholic Church. This was our church that we went to every Sunday morning. Uh, every other morning we prayed in chapel, but this was the church, and this is again, I took this photograph in 07, is the typical Greek <coughs> Eastern church. Now, I don't know who made the decision, but sometime in 1943, as I recall, it was the fall, a decision was made to take a group picture. And <clears throat> we are standing in front of the church together with the person who was in charge of us, who was Brat Daniel, Brother Daniel who was there with a the beard. And most of these children's, children are orphans or children that their parents could not take care of them. I am right here, <coughs> dressed in a Ukrainian shirt. And there are two other Jewish boys in this picture. And they're standing in front of me, one to my right, and one to my left. <clears throat> the one to my left in front is, his name is Oded, but I know him as Dorko. And I finally found him in a complex series of looking and tracing. I finally found him in the 1990s uh, in Israel. And he had a very interesting story because he was in fact born in Palestine. His parents had been Polish. They moved to Palestine in the 1920s, I think, or early 30s. And he was born in Palestine. And in the summer of 1939, his parents decided to visit their parents in Poland and took him with them. And they went back after the summer in August of 39, but decided to leave him for an extended stay with his grandparents. And the war broke out, and so they were separated, and somehow he got into the monastery and was saved, and then went back after the war. <clears throat> the young man who is the boy who is who was younger than we, who was standing to my right in front. Uh, his name is Daniel, Adam Daniel Rothfeld. I knew him as Daniel. And I didn't find him until communism fell in Eastern Europe. And it turns out that he had lost his entire family. And so no one claimed him and he remained in the monastery. He finally was repatriated to Poland, to an orphanage which apparently had terrible conditions, and he walked back to the monastery, then was repatriated again to a different um, orphanage at which they saw his talents and encouraged him to study. He eventually became a professor of international relations at Warsaw University and eventually became the foreign minister of Poland. Today he is highly regarded in Poland as a lecturer, an author, and a diplomatic leader. And among his many accomplishments are the Helsinki Accords. And he was the one 
who negotiated peace in Moldova for Gorbachev when he found himself in difficulties. <coughs> so for a little village, we did OK. <laughs> <coughs> this monastery was self I just have a question. Yes, I'm sorry, in case it doesn't come up. Are there any girls? <coughs> no. All boys. All boys. I can't tell you why. I don't know. Uh, perhaps this was a boys, and maybe there was another girls in another village. I don't know. But these were all boys. <coughs> The monastery was self-sufficient in food. And in addition to the monastic responsibilities, the members ran basically a farm. And part of our chores as children was to help in the farm. We milked cows, took the sheep to pasture, spread manure on the fields, and helped with planting and harvesting. We also went to school, and we had a school, village schoolmaster, whose name was Mikola Duke. And unbeknown to us, Mikola Duke was hiding a five-year-old boy, his mother, and an aunt in a school attic, which we didn't know about. That little boy's name was Roald Hoffman. And he would become a professor of chemistry at Cornell and a Nobel laureate in chemistry, as well as a published poet and playwright. In 1943, the Germans confiscated our church bell and most of the animals. The winter that year was unusually snowy and cold. Hunger was now added to our miseries. In the spring of 1944, the front moved closer to us as the Soviet forces advanced. Battles raged all around us. Locally, Ukrainians fought on both sides, both the German side and the Russian side. And a makeshift field hospital was established in our church. We had no physicians, but we did have a medic. His name was Vitaly Matkovsky, and he was in charge of this so-called hospital. And for reasons unknown to me, he picked me as one of his assistants. And my job was to make sure we had clean bandages. So as soon as someone died, I would remove the victim's bandages and wash them carefully and re-roll them. And after battles, I would go into the woods, look for dead soldiers, especially German soldiers, and search their belongings for medical supplies, especially for bandages. On Sundays, the families of the wounded farming boys would visit and in gratitude would bring me fresh eggs and other food, and I rapidly learned that one person's misfortune can be another's good luck. We were finally liberated by the Soviets in July 1944, and now a new phase started. The atheist Soviet government started to arrest the priests, and especially the Ukrainian priests, because the Ukrainians were nationalists who wanted no part of Soviet domination, and they eventually <clears throat> outlawed the Uniate Greek Catholic Church. It went underground. And this beautiful monastery was turned into a um, was turned into an insane asylum for women. My friend Daniel, who I told you was the foreign minister, told me that <clears throat> while the Soviets were still in control, he was sent as a he was sent to Lvov for a conference. And he asked the people if they would take him to Univ. 
so he could visit. And so he was taken by an official delegation to this insane asylum. <clears throat> and he said to me, I was standing there, and he said, do you remember where we used to pile the manure? We had a manure pile from which we then took it out to the fields. He said, do you remember where we used to pile the manure? And I said, of course I do. And he said, well, imagine right in that where we had our manure, they had established a huge golden statue of Lenin. <laughs> he said, and here I am standing, and I'm supposed to have a straight face as a diplomat, <laughs> with Lenin standing in this manure pile inside an insane asylum. So that's what they did. But when the Russians came, I was once again in danger now as a Ukrainian part of a monastery. But I managed to make my way back to Lviv to the archbishop's residence. And there I was reunited with my brother. And there I found out that the remainder of the family was no longer alive. I've always been very fortunate in my life, and <clears throat> I was taken in by a wonderful woman. Her name was Tala Wasserman, who lost her entire family. And we moved to Lvov, where I attended a Russian school. And after school, I used to work in a cosmetics store. And very often, Russian soldiers who just come from the front would come into the store to buy something. And there weren't many children around, and perhaps they had their own children that they were missing. But two of them came in one day and struck up a conversation with me and pinched my cheeks and other things that adults do to children that children don't appreciate. <laughs> and <clears throat> and um, finally they said to me, would you come and have a drink with us? And I said, sure. <laughs> so off we went to a lovely hotel called the Hotel George. And we, I had my first beer. <laughs> and a lovely Russian orchestra played Russian tangos. And on the way back, we passed by the opera house. They were taking me back to the cosmetic store. Passed by the opera house, which is a beautiful, beautiful opera house in Lviv. And there was a photographer there. And they said, one of them said, let's have three pictures taken so we all have a memory of this wonderful day. And so as a result, I have this lovely photograph taken, I think, about June 45. Uh, with two Russian officers uh, in front of the opera house in Lviv. I went to school there, and the only reason I'm showing you this is that fives are the best mark you can get. <laughs> <clears throat> if you can read Russian, you'll also notice that I had an unusually large number of absences. <laughs> And the reason for being absent was that I enjoyed riding the tram cars through the city of Lviv. And the uh, conductors were very good to me. I must have been very cute or something, but they were very good to me. And they allowed me to ride. And then they allowed me to help them change the direction of the electrical thing. So I got to know the city quite well. I did miss a lot of school, but and then someone told on me, and that was the end of that. <laughs> <clears throat> Here's the back of it, which gives my name uh, in, in Russian and the name of the, of the uh, school. Um, <clears throat> I, in May of 1945, we left the city, which now was known as Lviv, and moved to Poland, where I was enrolled in the Polish school. It was dangerous to admit that you were Jewish, 
so it was better to be a Roman Catholic. So I was admitted to school under the name of Leslov Kusharetsky, and I was now a Roman Catholic. Um, names and religions didn't mean very much. They could be changed like your clothes, and you can adapt to it. We left Poland in 1946 and went to England, uh, where my maternal grandparents and some aunts and uncles uh, managed, had managed to get from uh, Poland, uh, from Germany to England, were. And then in 1949, we were fortunate enough to come to the United States. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this is my last slide is to show you a book that I uh, published, uh, I think, this year, um, which tells much more detail about my family history as well as my own, in case you have an interest uh, in it. I thank you very much, and I thought I'd leave a little time over for questions if I can answer them. Before I do so, I would like to mention that we have in our midst the uh, lovely lady, Margot Jeremias, who is from Germany and who, in fact, uh, lived through Kristallnacht and has more memory of it. Or well, I have none, so she has more. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, if there are any questions specifically about Kristallnacht that I can't answer, she'll be, I'm sure, delighted to help. Yes? Uh, this is a question, but I knew of someone whose name was Leonard Katowitz. Does that mean he came from the Katowice family? Well, he worked for Jewish Welfare yes. Board. Katowitz, K-A-T-T-O-W-I-T-Z, is the German name for Katowice, which became, when it became Polish, it changed its name to Katowice. So Katowice is the German name. And as you know, um, when last names had to be adopted, one of the ways in which adoption, one of the names of, uh, ways in which names were created was the town that people came from. They never had the name in that town, because that'd be silly, but when they came to a new town, they were suddenly known as the person who came. So he very well, his family may very well have come from there, yeah. Any other comments? Margot, would you like to comment at all? I don't want to put you on the spot, <laughs> but I am. <laughs> And part of the reason in 1969 <coughs> why he went to Germany is his parents were from Vienna, born in Vienna, on Kristallnacht. Mm -hmm. And so he grew up speaking German. So in 1969, when everybody else was going to Vietnam, he got sent to Germany. <laughs> Yes. Where, where did you get your training as, to be a physician? Um, I got most of my, all my training in the United States. I came here, um, as I said, in 1949. Uh, they didn't quite know what to do with me in school because I didn't fit into the, I didn't go to, you know, I went here and there and everywhere. So I, they gave me a bunch of exams and I was able to finish high school in two years. So I finished in 51. I was just a little less than 16 years old at that time. And then went to college here and went to medical school here and got my medical training here. So all my education really is in the United States, except for my knowledge of English language. That was British. <laughs> what is the origin of the name? Uh, it's, a, it's a complex issue. Um, <laughs> like most things, um, there are two theories. <laughs> I'll give you the theory that I prefer, that I think is the correct one. The ending ides in Greek means the son of. And like you've heard of Maimonides, that's because his father was Maimon. So he is the son of Maimon. And patronymics is one of the most common ways in which names were created. So if Hamaidis is a patronymic, then it's the son of Chama. 
And Chama was an old Hebrew name mentioned in the Talmud quite a few times. Now my father's na first name was Kalman Kalonimus. Kalonimus in Greek means a beautiful name. And a person who has studied this says that statistically everyone who is named Kalman Kalonimus comes from Luca in Italy, which of course was part of the Roman Empire. So my theory is, but it's only a theory, is that when Judea fell, my ancestors went to the Roman Empire. Uh, when the Roman Empire was divided into the Greek and Roman parts, uh, the intellectuals spoke Greek, and I'd like to think they were intellectual. And, um, and so they got Greek names. And it's not very far. In fact, the first inhabitants of eastern Poland didn't come from Germany. They came f across the Black Sea and turned left. Um, and, and so I think that that's the most likely way in which, but I don't know, <laughs> is the answer. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, why are all the little boys uh, wearing uh, <clears throat> crew cuts uh, in the monastery? <clears throat> Uh, we were all immediately shaven on coming, and uh, I remember that as an extremely traumatic event. I was always very, before I lost it naturally, I was very proud of my hair. And my hair was very important to me. And so, but we were all immediately shaved. I think it's a hygienic measure in probably trying to avoid lice. Uh, you know, lice were an important very important during the Second World War because they caused typhus epidemics. So, so it was not only an aesthetic thing, it, was, it had to do with health. There was no way to treat typhus, and so this was a, a basically a sentence of death, so it was important to prevent. Yes? Was it your experience as a medical <coughs> helper that prompted you to go into medicine? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea whatsoever. I don't know what prompted me to do anything. <laughs> yes. Yes, ma'am. Sometimes I've heard you say Lviv, and then sometimes Lvov. Okay. Are, were they two different cities? No. Um, okay. The name is Lviv in Polish. L W O with a thing on it, W. That's the Polish name. Lvov, L-V-O-V, is the Russian name. Lviv is the Ukrainian name. And Lemberg is the German name. And it's all the same place. <laughs> so depending on who was in charge, the name changed. Today it's known as Lviv. <clears throat> You were very young when, when you were <clears throat> separated from your parents, so you probably didn't have much Jewish training at that point. And then you went to <clears throat> Catholics and yeah. Ukrainian. And what do you consider yourself now? Oh, I'm Jewish. There's no question about it. Um, no, I was born Jewish. I always knew I was Jewish. I didn't know what it meant. Yeah. You're absolutely correct. I had no, except for whatever a seven-year-old has. Uh, but there's no training involved, and I had none afterwards until I came to the United States. When I came to the United States, I was 14, and I decided that I really it was time to find out what this uh, business was about and uh, what it meant. And so I went to um, Yeshiva University and applied to enter their program and they interviewed me and looked at my record, and they said, oh, you were in a monastery just a while ago, and then you're a Roman Catholic? I don't think so. <laughs> and so I was rejected, and, um, but I wouldn't take no for an answer, so I went back, and I went back, and I went back, and I think they finally got tired of me, and they admitted me. So at that point, I didn't know any Hebrew or uh, and, and so on, but I started learning, and I spent uh, six years, in addition to my regular education, 
um, I got a degree in Hebrew literature and um, before I went to medical school. Uh, so that's where I learned about my religion and my origin. But, but you're right, I didn't have any knowledge before that. <coughs> well, none very well. <laughs> Now, I, I speak Polish reasonably well, um, and I can make my way in German. I understand and read German better than I speak it. Um, and I can understand a little Russian, but I, I've forgotten a lot of my Russian. And when we were in Kiev, a lot of my Ukrainian came back, and I found I could understand it, but it wouldn't take long, but I don't consider myself fluent in it. Yes. How many of the children in the <coughs> picture that were with you in the monastery uh, have you had contact with? Just the two Jewish boys. I don't know the names of any of the others, and I, I don't know where they are. <coughs> yes. Where in the U.S. did you settle when you came to the U.S.? We came to New York, and uh, we're in New York for the first, from 49 to 59. When I finished medical school, I took my internship and residency in Rochester, New York. So I thought I was going out west. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, share with you that uh, in 1999, I had a fascinating experience. And I think of it as this presentation. I was the uh, president of the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, the regulators of insurance across the country. And it came to our attention that uh, there were many people, Jewish people, that had their life insurance policies taken over by the Nazis in 98 or 38 cents. And the challenge was to try to establish the records and to try to get monies back to the people affected. And I can recall a story, that, a telephone call I had when I was in Washington, and it was a woman saying that she had read that this was a possibility. possibility. Uh, and she didn't know the name of the company that her grandparents had the insurance with. But she can remember walking by that building when she was in Germany and that she was going to go to work and try to establish it so we could dig in further. And, uh, but we did find records. We had, there was a commission set up, the German government, uh, insurance companies, Jewish leaders uh, across the country, and insurance commissioners. And money was refunded, or not refunded, the money was paid back to families where records could be established that they had had insurance policies <coughs> confiscated and never uh, never recovered a dollar until 2000. Yeah. Many of these insurance uh, insurances were given out through an Italian company um, and I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, it's still a big issue because the requirements of the insurance company are impossible to document. You have to document death. And please. We tried to get the insurance back that my parents had. And it was very difficult to get. And at the end, they actually denied that we had it. Right. Yeah. Because they were not going to take it back. Yeah. And they actually denied it. Yeah. So we tried to get it back. So it's still an issue, and it's a, it's a sore point, because there are a lot of insurances in there. In fact, there are records of, on the web of people who have insurances and you can't collect on. Yeah, but we, not that I won't go any further, yeah, but yeah. we actually uh, found <coughs> that there were records in the basement of a number of the large companies, Allianz and uh, Allianz is the one yeah, that I was still trying to think and, of. And yeah. we were, they were brittle and broken, but we could find that, that, you know, put them on microfiche and then backtrack. But as you point out, it was very difficult 50, 60 years we later. Yeah, but there were money, you know, paid. My, my father actually was an agent for them for a while. Is that right? Yeah. Way back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah very difficult. Yes, ma'am. Other than the photograph that your nanny gave you, how did you come to have those other <coughs> photographs of your family and your report card? Because uh, when, when you were first brought to the cathedral, that everything was taken away from you so that you could be discovered. So how did you get all the photographs of your family? And your my my pre-war photographs, I was very fortunate that because we lived in Poland and 
my maternal grandparents lived in Germany, my mother was very good about sending frequent photographs to my grandparents. And when my grandparents went to England in 1939, they took the, the photo album with, you, with them. So as a result, I have, I'm very uh, fortunate in having, I only showed one or two, but I have a lot of photographs from pre-war. The report card, the Russian report card, was already after the war, and I'm sort of a pack rat. I, I don't uh, uh, I pity my descendants. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> so I carried everything with me. So I, I still have, uh, I want you to know, a book that I borrowed from the monastery library <laughs> and did not return. So I don't know what the fine on it is, so I'm <laughs> being very quiet about it, particularly in the library here. But <laughs> you are very fortunate because um, I'm sure the 99.9% .9 right. of the survivors mm -hmm. have nothing. Nothing, to yeah. I realize that, yes. Yes, ma'am. How did you uh, get your, um, I guess it would be your Uncle Joseph's um, award, uh, his uh, medal? The, the picture... The picture that I showed you was not his medal. The picture that I showed you was, was the medal that was given out. It was a, 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 was a copy of a medal that was given out, but it was not his medal. The letter was a copy that my grandparents had. So the original went, but I did have a copy so I could make a photocopy of it. I scanned it. <laughs> Is your brother here? Did your brother come <coughs> to the U.S. with you? No, my brother um, went to England with me, uh, then went to um, Israel, uh, fought in the War of Independence, and then was in the um, Israeli intelligence in Mossad, was sent out uh, to Vienna in 1956 during the Sinai campaign and, and Hungarian uprising to help bring out Hungarian Jews. And then he decided that he had had enough of all of this and he started studying math and physics. He got his uh, PhD in physics and then went to Australia and retired after many years as a professor of physics in the University of Melbourne. And uh, so he lives in Australia. How did he survive? Was he taken to a different monastery? He was, we were always kept separate so that we wouldn't give each other away. Um, he was not as fortunate as I. He didn't have a stable situation. He, in fact, was moved 12 times uh, to different uh, homes and situations. Uh, as things became heated up in one place, he was moved to another. So he didn't have the stability of being in one place uh, the way I did. <clears throat> At the time you were at the monastery, what was your level <clears throat> of awareness and understanding of what was going on at the time? Um, I didn't have much awareness, I don't think. I mean, by going on, I somehow knew I was Jewish but I'm not sure what that meant, but I knew I was Jewish. For instance, I identified the two Jewish boys and remembered them and didn't remember any of the others. So there was obviously an identification there. Um, but, um, and I, as far as what was going on in the cities, I knew there was murder going on because I could see some of the evidence of it, but I really didn't know the extent or didn't understand it at that age, certainly. Uh, I was too concerned about where my next meal was going to come from <laughs> and how I was going to milk the cow when I had never seen a cow before. <laughs> I had other things on my mind. <clears throat> yes? Were the people who did you, the, the monastery uh, nuns, I guess, were they honored as righteous Gentiles? Uh, we didn't have nuns. Now, one of the interesting things was that this was an all-male situation, and and so it was uh, it would, that had another issue with it. But but uh, we had no nuns. As far as uh, honoring, yes, um, 
Brother Daniel, brother Daniel, whom I uh, showed you a picture of, uh, has been honored. Um, uh, Sheptitsky's brother, uh, Clement, Clementi, has been honored by Yad Vashem, and also has been made a saint by the by Rome, and he's now Saint Clementi. Um, unfortunately, Andrei Sheptitsky, who was the head of the church has not been honored. And that was why it was so important for us to have him honored by other bodies. And that's a complex issue. He had, some, he had a letter in which he welcomed the Germans and that was held against them. And it's all nonsense, but, but nevertheless, there's a lot of politics. One of the problems is that Andrei Sheptitsky was the head of the Ukrainian church. The Ukrainian church was a very nationalistic church. He served a number of years in Siberia as a prisoner of the Russians and hated the Russians with a passion. And when the Russians took over Ukraine, they were very afraid of his memory uh, because he had the ability, even after he died, his memory had the ability to rouse people. And so they besmirched him. And the Russians put out a tremendous amount of literature, called him a collaborator and so on and so forth. And that made everything, muddied things up. And it's only now that I think things are becoming a little bit clarified and trying to separate out the Russian propaganda from, from the reality. So, uh, so many of them have been honored. I'm sure not all. Yes? Since you weren't taken from your family <coughs> I was seven. I was seven. I was seven. It, it was a very difficult adjustment. Uh, you know, it's very difficult for me to speak about it because I'm not objective. Um, so uh, I can't really answer your question, but obviously the adjustment was a terribly difficult one because I, and I might m add that there were, there's a history of a number of children who had to be taken back to their parents and who perished because they could not adjust. So, so um, somehow I was able to adjust, but I honestly am not the best person to analyze why <laughs> or how. <laughs> yes? Did the other uh, children know that you were Jewish? Because <clears throat> you said you knew the other two boys were Jewish. How did you? I don't. I'm not surprised that, they, uh, that you knew that. I, I don't know that the other two boys knew. I'm not sure whether I spoke to them about it. I don't know. Um, certainly none of the non-Jewish boys knew because I would be immediately um, and that would immediately go to the Gestapo. So I had to be very, very careful not to ever mention the fact that I was Jewish. So it, no, it was absolutely not a topic of conversation. <clears throat> I thank you very much, yes. How many different names were you given? Well, I was, I was given my original name, which I have now. And then the Ukrainian name, which was Lev Kuchaminsky, and then Leslav Kusharetsky in Poland. That was for a brief period of time. And so, not too many. <laughs> Thank you very much.